Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I am still emotioned after more than 10 Euro Python. I am Roberto Bolli, and I work at Partech on Secure Resilient Cloud Platform. And I spent the last five years in the digital transformation, in the Italian digital transformation team, working on API interoperability and standards. And today, in this opinionated talk, opinions are my own, uh, I will present the current state of digital services in the European Union with a focus on normative and technical changes and their impacts on digital platforms. This requires introducing um, the, the European institutions and the strategy that the Union has on cross-border services. It will then present the digital identity as a case study to show some cross-border interoperability challenges. And finally, uh, I will show the European interoperability framework that helps improving the user experience, cybersecurity, and maintainability of uh, digital public platforms, but this applies to every service that has to work cross-border. So if you have a service that needs to work between different countries, roughly the same principles apply. If we have time, uh, we will speak uh, about the uh, impacts of the Cyber Resilience Act on open source, but uh, there have been panels on, on this, so um, let's, let's check. So what's the European Union? Well, it's a lot of people, languages, wonderful places like Prague, a great wave to Prague. Uh, and well, uh, for me, is having 27 member states that stopped fighting each other, and that's really great, but Conway's law applies, and the union structure affects digital services. So let's meet the union. Broadly speaking, uh, European laws require the agreement of three institutions, legislative, that is the parliament elected by citizen, and the council composed by member state ministers reunited by sector, and executive, that is the European Commission, that is agreed by member states and the parliament. Well, shortly, you have a two-lane governance. On one side, there is the parliament that is uh, elected directly by citizen, and on the other side, there are member states. And as you can see, uh, every institution works per sector. And this really affects our lives. Maybe uh, we don't know, but it, it actually does. The parliament works in committees, the council uh, per ministry, and the European Commission that is divided in a sort of uh, ministries uh, per directorate general. So we have vertical uh, structure and sectoral uh, structure. Don't be afraid. And since the union is founded on international treaties, uh, the commission can only propose laws cited in uh, uh, specific policy areas mentioned by treaties. What does it mean for digital? That uh, for digital, the policy areas that motivates uh, what we experience every day, for example, from the digital green certificate to the uh, European digital system or the Cyber Resilience Act or all the laws uh, about mobile phones, mobile chargers that the Euro European Union has made uniform uh, are based on uh, these policy areas. For example, the functioning of the internal market, see the phone chargers, and the European uh, telecommunication networks. And all the stuff materializes in two principal law types. The regulation, see the GDPR. Regulation are the same law for all countries. GDPR is one law in all countries. Another law that is uh, regulation is the IDAS regulation that it establishes the identity framework for Europe. And the other one is directed. A directive sets a goal. All the countries want to do something, for example, uh, and this is the case for digital payments. 
In Europe, we want to enable digital payments. Okay, uh, a directive um, they decided that goal, and every country implemented uh, this uh, directive in their own way. There are other types of re laws, but we are not interested in that. Shortly, it's very easy. Uh, three institutions, the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission, discuss for at least, at least two years, and then everybody agrees on regulation binding the same law in all Europe, or directives implemented by member states. Governance is shared between member states and uh, the European Parliament, and the one of the real issue, but it applies to many stuff, okay? Digital is affected by different policy areas. So it's a very complex method. Digital is pervasive, it's a, it's a very complex method. So, while digital is affected by different policy areas, there is one strategy, the digital decade. It set for goals and associated indicators, skilled population and professional, secure infrastructures, digital transforma uh, transformated business, and digital public services, there are the main focus of this presentation. Okay, this is, seems very general, but actually, legislative actions like the Cyber Resilience Act, the Digital Service Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act that made uh, regulations, that regulates all this part of our lives map to those goals. And well, there are various monitoring instruments such as the indicators provided by the digital compass. There is the uh, DZ index and the NIFO interoperability observatory. Well, the nice thing of the, those uh, monitoring system is that they're published. So you can go on the website, you can download the slides. You can click on those links and check your country. There are all these reports. Some have some nice infographics, and so you can monitor if your country is, uh, if your country is uh, doing okay or not. And you can even try to support your country because our countries, our member states need us. So let's zoom on digital services. Uh, always more difficult, maybe uh, nobody knows, uh, remembers the, the Dustrevo d'Asterix, uh, but uh, I grow with that, with Asterix and Double X running on and off uh, between uh, these bu uh, bureaucratic offices looking for the past 838. So, uh, the Europe want to get rid of that. Uh, and uh, today we will present the European digital identity that is established by the EIDAS regulation. It allows cross-border electronic identification, authentication and trust services. What's that? For example, a citizen, me, with an, an Italian digital identity, I have one, well, actually I have two, can authenticate to a Dutch digital service, for example, to file a complaint. Uh, I, I did it, well, I didn't file the complaint because uh, I, I was not uh, a user of that digital service, but they were able to log in and start file, filing the forms. Or for example, I can digitally sign a document with my uh, Italian uh, digital identity and send it to a French company and it is a valid digital signature. And another example, uh, do you remember the COVID digital green certificates? No, nobody. <laughs> you were lucky. Okay, well, they were exactly digital sign documents acknowledged by all European countries. And it was a stepping stone for the second revision of the EIDAS regulation. Another um, important thing is the once-only principle that is established by the single uh, digital gateway regulation. So you can see uh, infrastructures and regulation because you need a regulation, you need a law to create infrastructure. It's not something uh, that you can say, let's create something. Why do you want to do it? You need regulation. Even for spending money, your countries uh, need to write regulation before spending money or investing something. Uh, so the once only principle states, well, that's 
mind-blowing. Administration must reduce administrative burden, reorganizing their internal processes, and exchanging data provided by citizen and business, eventually creating cross-border services. That's stunning. And then there is software they use. Uh, it is incentivized via the open source software strategy, but is then threatened by the last, um, the current proposal because it has not been um, approved yet and is still under discu discussion, discussion. So let's start with the European Digital Identities instituted by the EIDAS regulation. EIDAS is more than digital identity, but we just have time for this now, sorry. A member state, that is Italy, France, uh, Czech Republic, can qualify its digital identity system as EIDAS compliant. What does it mean, qualify? It means that your country is not forced to do it. It can do it. And if, in this case, those identities can be used to log in to qualified digital services provided by other member states. And this system is working right now. And uh, check whether your country provides you an European digital identity. And you can uh, try on the next screen, prepare your phone on the next screens, prepare your phone. There will be a QR code for logging in into the European Union website. Uh, but since every member state has its own list of identity providers and different user attributes. Uh, they require a national gateway, national components. So you see there are two users, different countries that are trying to uh, use the service of a Belgian university. Uh, the Italian, uh, the, the user with the Italian identity is redirected to the Italian uh, identity infrastructure that does all the check and replies uh, to, um, and then brings back the user on the Belgian university. And this is the same for the Dutch user. The uh, fact is that you have 27 of those blocks. So there are a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of checks. Uh, you, have, uh, you will be requested to continuously give consent for your data uh, going from your national identity provider to a foreign country. And the general architecture is, is quite complex, but works. And a major challenge is the re-identification of a user from another member state in time. Member states might not rely on identifiers that persist over time, not on unique identifiers. This means that the same German citizen can access an Italian service using a given identifier in 2020 and a different identifier in 2024. Uh, well, how can I recognize him? His identity has been changed. But well, this is not a problem inside a single state, since internally every state can implement for the checks and use different sources in case of homonymies. In cross-border interaction, our aligned member states cannot access all the information of the country of origin. So in case of homonymies, a service may not be granted. Uh, well, this is a problem. I, I don't want to focus on, the, on this problem, but on, on the general case. The case of persistent identifiers is debated between member states. Uh, some say it is a threat to privacy. Some say that whatever we do, Facebook already has all your information, so why don't use it to provide services? But uh, my personal uh, opinion, what I've noted, is that uh, this kind of issue only hinder services for citizens. This is because in case of issuing sanction, the regulatory framework of all the countries already allows gathering all the information they need. So if uh, you, have, you need to be sanctioned for something you have done, there are all the legal background to identify you. But if uh, you need uh, to consume a service, 
there are, uh, since the, the framework doesn't allow all those exchanges, uh, there uh, are uh, data protection concerns. So, uh, but the point is, this is a, um, an, a topic where not all member states agree. Uh, this was the screen. If you want to try your EIDAS login experience, you can try on the uh, European Union website. Uh, you will be prompted with all the countries that currently have uh, EIDAS supported identities and the other countries will eventually um, join in time. But the first time that you will be asked is which is your country because you will be redirected on your country's gateway. Uh, currently, uh, you should just focus on the EIDAS um, login. There are other ways of login, but they are, I mean, uh, facility logins, uh, for example, Google. But they are not uh, capable of identifying yourself. While if you log in with your uh, European identity, they will know that it's you. Okay, so uh, it's uh, another way, quality of a... Um, the quality of the authentication is different. So, EIDAS authentication is a great case of study for interoperability challenges. It has technical component, organizational challenges, and so on. The European interoperability framework supports the creation of user-centered, interoperable digital services, and the governance layers are one of the pillars and classify possible challenges. Number one, legal constraints. Uh, is my service legal in all other states? Do I need to implement further functionalities? For example, I take out functionalities. This means that creating cross-border service requires to address at first legal issue. Do you remember GDPR and all the stuff? Legal issues first. Then comes organizational issues. They are related to the inner functioning of organization, such as uh, institution on on, or companies. Well, it's Conway, uh, Conway's law again. Then we have semantic issues that cover both meaning and syntax of exchange data. Do my API use the same format? If our APIs use different format, our system cannot cooperate. If I use SAML and your identity system use uh, OpenID Connect, we cannot interoperate. Uh, do we use the same currency or temperature scale? Otherwise, we are communicating information, but they have not the same meaning. Uh, I made a talk on this topic, and if you're, if you're interested in that, just uh, call me back. And then there is the technical interoperability. It defines all the required standards, protocol and infrastructure, such as OpenAid specification, TLS encryption algorithm, URLs, and, and so on. So you can see this as a design pipeline. If you don't address a legal issue in, a, in the legal layer, it will shift to organizational layer, and so on, until reaching the technical layer. And the more issue you shift right, the more you'll see your service will be um, unusable. Okay. <laughs> We can see that all the issues, uh, well, this is a split up of the EID uh, on the various layers. Uh, I'm not just uh, going all through that, but uh, I want to go back to the first example. Uh, all the issue that I haven't addressed at the legal layer, that is where member states couldn't agree in a suitable time, eventually shift rights. So, uh, since there is no agreement on cross-border identification, in case of homonymy, service providers have to establish organizational identi identification procedures. So they have to identify procedures, maybe they will call each other, is uh, Bruno Gans the same Bruno Gans that came back with this identity? Well, they won't go probably, hopefully, by phone, but uh, it means that the, the issue uh, had shift back, shift uh, right. Uh, and so this is for fear of providing data to the wrong person. At this point, organization and service providers 
can decide to ensure identification. This is always an example on the EIDAS. They say another uh, topic, for example, digital payments, and you will have similar issues. Uh, so at this point, organization and service providers can decide to ensure identification with further data exchanges, creating one-to-one -one agreements. So instead of having one single European framework, uh, all the, the, the shifted uh, right topics are solved by member states. For example, since Italy and Germany has, for example, five million people, I just throw a number, maybe it's, it's more, uh, that work or interoperate cross-border, five million citizens, they decide that what they cannot agree at the European uh, side, they create specific infrastructure for communicating or checking identities between uh, the uh, Italian revenue system and the German revenue system, for example. Uh, this means procedure and eventually technical components. More hardware, more uh, software, uh, more tests that have to pass. So, uh, shortly, shift left interoperability. Legal and organizational interoperability enable direct communication between services because the legal and organizational framework is clear. Shifting right issues to the technical layer might increase uh, the overall complexity to n square because we have all to, to implement outside the legal and organizational framework, all the possible interaction and conversion and unit tests and integration tests and to upgrade all the platforms whenever a regulation in a single country is updated. So such point-to-point -point connectors address specific issues need to be maintained, operated, and eventually aligned with each member state's regulation. This increase architectural and transactional complexity and affects the security posture of the components and clearly of the whole ecosystem. So shifting left on the interoperability pipeline is key to ensure and to create secure, manageable cross-border services. One of the examples, for example, not on uh, national digital identities was OpenID Connect. Uh, you don't need to sign any agreement or, or specific or to create specific component to translate uh, op OpenID token from Google and Facebook. You just use OpenID um, tokens from Google, from, from Facebook. They have the same uh, fields, I mean, uh, clearly they don't, do not provide the same guarantees that uh, a certain identification does, but it, again, it's just an example. Every uh, block that shifts rights to the technical layer requires specific technical specifications, specific specifications, well, no puns intended, uh, that, are fall, uh, that are subject to the following risks. These I, these are, those are the risks that you have when uh, you define technical specification. Over complexity. Bureaucratic, non-digital processes are mapped, mapped to convoluted API design uh, without a proper redesign. Time constrained engineering. We have five people. We have six months to release a new specification for um, this topic. And whatever uh, we do, it will be released in six months. Uh, and it doesn't care. Uh, we are a strict, restricted group. Uh, there is a very small feedback. And um, this is very problematic. Another one, close development. The IT community is rarely involved in all these kind of specification. Development high happens in a close environment or for security reason. Uh, uh, sometimes even the specifications are closed. 
and redundancy uh, when a built-in variation of existing standard uh, without keeping in touch with the original communities, you will eventually end in a messy, complicated, and redundant specification. Well, we have five minutes. Um, I can uh, just, I just want to say uh, one thing about open source and uh, the Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, my understanding is, uh, is is that the problem is related to uh, facing this topic by different um, part, uh, different institutions, then not every institution have the same knowledge about the topic of open source. Uh, for example, the uh, Internal Market Committee made some good amendments uh, and improvements to the Resilience Act uh, proposal, while the in Industry Committee made some uh, pro further amendment that doesn't help uh, improving. Uh, this is because the industry mindset uh, is different from the um, market of people that, uh, from the mindset of people that works on internal mar market and in general products or software product, uh, products. So the, the main topic uh, is this one. It's, um, and it is important for us to discuss uh, and uh, support the discussion in our companies uh, on this topic and even with our friends that work in legal departments, for example. The legal, uh, le legal people is really, they are uh, good at legal, but they don't understand software. Software is not easy, digital is pervasive, so it, and it is very, um, very, very complex topic. Uh, so, uh, I am finished. Uh, sorry for the rush, and thank you. I don't know if we have one minute for Q&A, uh, but if we have, uh, what, well, that's it. Okay, well, if there are no questions, uh, you have one? No, no please. Uh, okay, uh, uh, one, one example for exa uh, on, on the uh, critic parts of the CRA that, uh, that equivalates professional software developers and manufacturers like Google and Samsung uh, is this one. When you say why uh, open source should require all the qualifications that uh, that you have asked even for single developers. And uh, industry, the industrial mindset tell us uh, a mobile phone manufacturer, for example, uh, Google, might refuse to provide security upgrades, telling that they just provided open source software and it is provided as is. So they are not forced, uh, they should be exempted of providing security upgrades on your mobile phone because it's open source. So uh, this is for saying that when we see all those regulations, the first thing we, we think is they are crazy. The fact is that they are not. They have a different mindset. We need to learn the different mindset, the different culture, and try to exploit them and explain better and discuss better uh, why uh, the re those regulations are problematic. So now it's really uh, the end.